Good evening, everyone. Um, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope and I pray that um, you have enjoyed your Sabbath yesterday um, and that the first day of the week has been promising and productive. And it is my prayer and my hope that um, as you look into the new week, that God will be with you in the work assignments, life assignments. I pray that uh, God blesses all of us with that spirit of excellence that he put into Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to execute all our duties with the highest standard of excellence and that the spirit of God will prevail for you um, in your different work circumstances, some may be working where the environment is not good. Um, I like the book of Daniel for many reasons, but one of the things I like about it is it talks about things that are happening daily, but because we see it as an old Bible book, we don't relate. But if you look at the book of Daniel, it really deals with challenges that many of us deal with every day. Uh, faith in the workplace. How do you deal with the sabotaging and jealous colleagues? Um, how do you gain the faith and confidence of your supervisor or your boss? We tend to read the book and uh, um, let me say for the sake of uh, not having better language, over-spiritualize it. But what we don't realize is that it is a fountain. Some of us are working in very bad work environments. Um, and, 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 and I pray that God would do for you what he did for Daniel um, to really cause your hard work and your excellence to speak for itself and to silence those forces and critics that um, may be seeking uh, to undermine your work. Some of us, um, we may be struggling to give our best. Go to Daniel uh, chapter 6. Read about the man whose work was so diligent, so well, so good, that uh, when his enemies were looking for weakness, they couldn't find anything in his work. Um, they had to try and see if they will find it uh, in his God. But even there, they discovered there was nothing to take advantage of. So let the book of Daniel inspire you. If you are needing energy uh, to pick yourself up and do better. Um, some of us are working with um, evil colleagues. It's it's a reality of life. Uh, Daniel had to deal with it, not once, um, where colleagues did not like him. And um, of course, my prayer is if your colleagues don't like you, it's because you are doing everything the right way. It would be very sad if you are a child of God, yet your colleagues don't like you because you are the cause of trouble. You are the reason things are not going well. Uh, you are the lazy one, the always quarreling one. If that's the case, of course, then my brother and my sister, you need to repent. <laughs> but uh, if they don't like you simply because as a child of God, you are pouring out your best. You are living out the excellence that the Father has put in you. Then it's my prayer that God may also address challenges for you as he did um, for Daniel. So I pray uh, over and above the 10 days of prayer and other things we are praying about. My prayer for this week is that may God bless you with a very productive, very meaningful uh, week full of victories in spite of the difficulties that one may face um, wherever you are. We are on day five um, of our uh, 10 days of prayer. And what we are looking at today is a theme that speaks about um, praying for the things that matter, okay? Uh, and of course, the, the, the text chosen there comes from the Lord's Prayer. However, we are going to look into this topic with emphasis on 1 Samuel 
uh, chapter one, the story of Hannah, Penina, Elkanah, and the birth of Samuel. And we are going to, however, focus on verse, uh, starting from verse 25, uh, going uh, all the way to 28. Just those three verses, verse 25 to 28 of First Samuel chapter 1. It says, Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am a woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have sent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. The Lord bless us in the reading of his word. May it deeply enrich our lives and bring us salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. The story of uh, the birth of Samuel is a well-known story and definitely features quite a lot in prayer services. And uh, the, the, the reasons are very clear and out there. I think for as long as we meet to pray, whether in a week of prayer or in any situation, one of the stories that will always feature as part of our prayer lessons will always be the story of Hannah. And the reason why, no matter how many times the story features, we are never tired of it, it is precisely because of its power uh, in teaching us what first it really feels like to pray fervently, but also the confidence that God does hear prayer. The story also captures so well the reality of praying for things that others have and you do not have, and that is being used against you. You know, the, the, the story really captures quite well for all of us, men and women in any part of the world. It captures for us the reality of becoming an outsider because of things you cannot control, because of things that are not in your hands to deal with, but you find them used against you and the pain that comes with it. So many of us relate with Hannah in so many different levels whenever we read the story. Um, as, as a minister and as a pastor, I cannot tell you how many times I have been asked to either preach on it or uh, 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 use it to encourage uh, in a prayer session or being asked to explain some of its elements. But no matter how many times you do that, you know that the power of the story never weakens because man does Hannah walk the reality of our lives, her pain, her circumstances, and the environment. And when we meet her now kneeling in front of uh, the temple with the high priest um, uh, Eli, of course, if you are from the western parts of the world, you will say Eli. Uh, but if you are from Africa and the Middle East, uh, you will say Eli, uh, which would be more closer to the biblical uh, pronunciation. Um, so they they see him. Uh, he's there. He is. He's looking at this woman. Uh, there praying. And the power of that story, and I connect it to today's theme for me, um, is that, you know, when Ellie sees her there praying, and the Bible, as it tells us, says she was praying. Her lips were moving, but words were not coming out. So he assumed she's a drunkard. That is why he rebuked her and said to her, woman, how long will you subject yourself to wine? Put away wine from yourself, you know, because obviously you are now doing embarrassing things. You are even a drunk mumbling here in front of the house of God. 
which is on its own sacrilege. And uh, she then responds and says, oh, my Lord, uh, I am not drunk with any wine, but I am a woman who is simply pouring out her heart to the Lord. And I think that's very important for a point of uh, encouragement today. And allow me to stick uh, to this story and to the scriptures in emphasizing something that is quite important. Beloved, prayer was not designed for God. God designed prayer for us. God doesn't pray. We, we, we need to remember that God does not pray. Who would he be praying to? Telling them what? God doesn't pray. Prayer is a communication line he designed for the human to speak to him through. So prayer is for the human. The human is praying to God. That's important. Because I think one of the things as I was preparing and going through the notes um, for today, I was a bit concerned with what was mentioned on day five by the authors, that we must not forget that prayer is about God. And here's my warning about that. Be careful of that statement because prayer is supposed to be where the human pours out their heart to God as Hannah did. And the fact that God answered her shows God listens when human beings pour out their hearts to him. The danger of wanting to remove how you feel when you pray is you may think you are praying when you are actually preaching to God. You are now sermonizing to God. The danger of wanting to be theologically correct when you pray is that you miss out on being real with God and you enter into some kind of a theological seminary with God. And now you are lecturing God about who he is, as if he doesn't know. God did not design prayer for us to tell him about himself. He knows himself. He gave us prayer for us to be able to connect with him. It's our opportunity. Ellen White says in, in Steps to Christ, and I absolutely love it. She says, prayer is as though one is talking to their friend. She says, when we pray, we do not bring God down to us, but he lifts us up to himself. And so you that thing that prayer is as speaking to a friend. Now, please understand me very well. If I've got a friend who has bought a new house and they invite me to come and see the new house, in that visit, yes, the first hour or two, we will walk around the house, they will show me Maybe they were building a house, now it's finished. They are showing me around. I am marveling. I am saying, oh, wow, what a beautiful home that you've built. But I can't be saying, oh, wow, what a beautiful home that you've built for the whole six-hour visit. Once I've congratulated the house and its beauty, we will then get into things that make our friendship. So the challenge with coming to God in prayer wanting to sound theologically correct. So I won't bring a list. I won't ask um, because I don't want to sound like someone who's always asking. Well, okay, so you've come to God. What are you going to do? No, I'm just going to 
um, phrase him and make him the focus. Okay? So a whole 30 minutes you are kneeling, you are lecturing God about his goodness. But that's not what he designed prayer for. L look at Jesus teaching us how to pray. When he teaches us the Lord's prayer, the first two verses are exalting God. From there onwards, we deal with the things people need from God. So please be very careful. God is not offended by people who come to him asking for things. He designed prayer so that people come and ask. But when we create the impression that people should hold back on their needs from God and should spend more time trying to sound theologically correct, it, it almost presents God as a narcissist who, who wants to hear us feed his ego about himself. Look at the Lord's Prayer. Yes, there's parts where we should worship, exalt, acknowledge who God is. But that's not the whole prayer. Once God is exalted, then the human must use prayer for what it is designed for. To surrender to God. To speak to him about things that trouble us. To seek advice. To seek guidance. To seek solutions. To seek miracles. To seek his presence. So God is the center of prayer in our attitude. Yes. Yes. Because there's no point in praying if you don't believe God answers prayer, then why are you doing it? So the attitude of prayer focuses on God, but the content of prayer must help the human. Because prayer doesn't help God. God gains no benefits from the prayer. God is not in need of prayers. So it is the human in the content of prayer who must tell God what they are seeking. And in that process, they are demonstrating trust in God. Because that is what prayer is about. Prayer is not also an information line for God where he gets updated about the things he doesn't know. Just, I think yesterday, I was preaching on my ministry page about Isaiah chapter 40. God writing to the children of Israel about their exile in Babylon 100 years before it happens. He is already telling them that those who were in Babylon were not even born at the time of Isaiah chapter 40. But God writes to them and, 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 and the letter in other words will meet them in the future. By the time they were born and taken to exile, when they read the book of Isaiah, they discover God had already predicted a hundred years ago what would happen and has written them a letter with how to manage their faith in the crisis until he delivers them. If God knows the future as the Bible demonstrates, then quite clearly, God does not use prayer to be updated about the things he doesn't know. No, on the contrary, God gives the human prayer as a platform of exercising faith and trust, as a way of saying, I know that this problem should not consume me as if I am godless. So I have come to talk to you, God, about it, and in doing so, I am demonstrating my faith that I know that all things are possible with you. And I'm asking you to quiet my doubt, quiet my fears, while you address this challenge that I have. That is why in, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah comes to pour her heart to God. Beloved, please hear me very well. I get concerned when I hear people being told to pray methodical, measured, um, surgically cleaned prayers, because then it worries me 
what then is the point? If one is not engaging with God in the reality of their pain, you can go to Jesus, praying at Gethsemane. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. That's real. That's raw. That's painful. And Ellen White says in the desire of ages, he was brought, Jesus was brought to the point of sweating, uh, sweat and blood because of the, uh, the immense pressure he was under. That's the reality of prayer. Now, I think we ought to be very careful of choreographing prayer. You know, it's like here in, uh, in Africa. You'll find uh, people praying sometimes in ways that make you suspicious. Do you, are you really talking to God? Saying things like, oh, thou thee, thine greatest. And you're thinking, but we are Africans. Even the English who gave us this language no longer say this, thou thee. They, they left it in the Elizabethan era. So is this prayer about sounding right? Is this prayer about sounding correct? Or is one pouring their heart to God? So when we say, when we pray, we must uh, uh, focus on the things that matter. I, I, I just want us to be very careful there of wanting to decide for people what should matter. What matters cannot be decided by the Adventist church or your local pastor. It's you. You, the one going to God, you know what matters right now. And there's no point saying to God, oh, thine the greatest, holiest, uh, and, and, and then saying amen, yet you left with baggage in your heart. If one goes to God in prayer, one must know we have come to a God who loves us, who has designed prayer so that we may get to communicate with him. So in prayer, I, the heart that is going through life, know what matters. Not someone sitting in a prayer office at the general conference, designing notes for 10 days of prayer and deciding when you pray, pray the things that matter. Don't bring a list to God. But how? How do you know what truly matters to the heart that is broken and suffering? Only that heart. You see that what we are learning in the story of, of First Samuel? A leader made a mistake. A leader thought she was drunk. And she says, no, 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 no. I'm pouring my heart to God. What is this story about? It teaches us no one should moderate another person's prayer. No one has been given by God the power of moderation. Oh, you are praying okay. Oh, yes, your, your prayer sounds like it has all its priorities in order. Very good. Yeah, let's tick that box. No, every human must come to God in faith and in confidence that the God I am praying to will hear the things that matter to me. And Romans 8, powerful, powerful verses. The Holy Spirit, not your pastor, not the general conference, not the division, not the union, the Holy Spirit will utter your prayers before the throne of God in unknown groanings. In other words, even to decide what is the priority to answer will be decided by God. Please listen to that very carefully in Romans 8. So when you pray, your duty is to pour your heart. It is God's duty to then filter the prayer and say, okay, knowing you, my child, I'm going to answer this. It matters first. That one I know you think is urgent, but it's actually number three. That one, let's put it at number six. Let's move what you call the number 10 to number two. It, it is important. 
Do you see in Romans 8 who does that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one determining priorities in your prayer. What you and I need to do is to simply pour our hearts to him. The church must pray. But I find that we discourage people to pray when we are trying to monitor them, moderate them. We make prayer complex and difficult. Like now you must just have a theology degree just for praying so that your prayer must sound right or dali priorities. No, no, beloved, no, beloved. Nowhere in the Bible does God say your prayers are unorderly. In the Bible, God receives prayer and Romans 8 says the spirit of God sorts out what should be done. Why? Because the one praying has trusted their God. Now they have left it to the God who loves them to deal with it. The priority of prayer is very simple. Trust the God you are praying to. Trust him and tell him everything. Pour your heart to God when you pray. Give him everything in prayer. Give him praise. Give him worship. Make requests. Cry. Tell him where you are upset. Tell him where he confuses you. Give him your heart in prayer. Because prayer is not designed for God. Prayer is designed for us. It's not God who needs prayer. It's us who need to pray. So we need to use prayer effectively. When we are praying, it should just come out clean that we are using the avenue that God has given us. When we pray, give God all that is in your heart. He wants to hear it all. From worship and exaltation, anger and disappointment, confession and repentance, confusion, all of it. It is his divine prerogative to then sort out what are priorities. If the human can sort out the priorities of prayer, why pray? The human has already done it. The human no longer needs God. The human is now proven to be capable. But remember, part of praying is the surrender and the humility to admit to God that I cannot do this on my own. Do this for me. So once the human has to sort out priorities before praying, it seems the human is slowly but surely growing to not need God. Today you will sort out priorities. Tomorrow you will be deciding what God should and shouldn't answer. A few years down the line, it's okay. You are no longer praying. You figured out how to do things. Prayer comes with a humility of knowing that we don't possess the wisdom to live this life by our terms. So we will just go to God. In faith and in love, we will just give him everything. We will surrender everything to him. And we will let him take all of it. Praise and everything. Struggles and everything. And in faith, we will wait for him to sort us out. Hannah poured her heart to the Lord. And in that pouring, she gave God what were the priorities of her life at that time. And God answered when the time was right. God answered. God did not come back and say, sorry, I didn't like your priorities in your prayer. God answered at the right time. Because I say it again, the duty of the human is to trust God in prayer. Not to do God's work in prayer. Not to sound right in prayer. The duty of the human is to trust the almighty God in the name of Jesus. It is to trust 
the almighty God in the name of Jesus, to give it to him, leave it at his feet, get up, walk away with a smile. When they ask you, why are you smiling? Like Hannah, you answer, now that I've handed it to God, I've handed it over to the safest hands in the universe. I've given it away. I trust him to now see me through. I pray and hope this evening that when you pray, you don't feel the need to sound right or be orderly. Give God everything. Yes, prayer must give God praise. Prayer must give God, give God worship. Prayer must also give him what we need. Prayer must give him confession and repentance. Prayer must also tell him we need bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Prayer must also tell him we are looking for strength. Things are hard. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Prayer must tell him we need power to overcome. That is what prayer must do. It must pour out. Because prayer is about trusting God. So if you ask me what are the priorities of your prayer, my answer to you is give God everything that's in your heart. Give it to him. He's been God since eternity. I think he can handle it. The Bible itself and how he dealt with prayers and our own lives and the prayers that he has answered is proof. God can handle us in prayer. We don't need to polish ourselves. We just need to come in faith and be truthful. He knows how to handle us. He knows how to deal with us. He knows where we are. He gave us prayer so he can meet us in reality, in our point of need, in our point of joy, in our point of praise, wherever we are at that time. He's ready to receive us. Elder, I will now invite you to lead us in intercessory prayer. And it is my prayer and my hope that we will pray with open and poured out hearts where we trust the Holy Spirit, as in Romans 8, to lead us in the priorities. May God bless.